Good evening, I'm David Nicholas. Next on CMU Public Television, Bill Ballinger of Inside Michigan Politics on Capitol Report. Welcome to Capitol Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. Thank you for joining us for our 2014 season premiere. Uh, we're in a Senate meeting room up on the fourth floor of our state capitol, thanks to the offices of State Senator Judy Emmons for making the coordination for our visit here today. And we're pleased to welcome back to our program Bill Ballinger of Inside Michigan Politics. Happy New Year, Bill. Always good to see you. Happy New Year, Dave. It's always a pleasure. We're sitting down on a Friday, and it is the day after the fourth State of the State Address delivered by Governor Rick Snyder. Uh, your immediate takeaway from this speech and, and how it may have been similar or, or different from the previous three. Again, uh, the governor is not a great orator. I think we know that. I don't think he's measurably improved, frankly, in three years. Uh, but I'd say the interesting thing about these speeches that the governor has given, and it's probably true of other governors in the past, you'll notice in the odd number of years, the non-election years like 2011, 2013, he came up with some really pretty big, hard-hitting stuff. You remember 2011, it was the bridge over the Detroit River, which became hugely controversial for the next two years. And then last year, it was let's hike taxes and fees to fund a 10-year improvement program at $1.2 billion a year to fix our roads and bridges. Uh, but in 2012, which was a campaign year, in 2014, you really look at the speeches and regardless of how they were delivered, there really wasn't much there that was controversial or kind of big picture. Uh, aggressive proposals. Uh, at least I didn't hear anything last night. But given the fact that we expect him to formally announce that he's seeking a second term, right. and once again the state house will be up for election, and the Senate once right. again, is this what you expected from y the speech? Yes, I mean this is, as I said, past governors have operated this way too. Because you don't want to come up with a lot of big picture stuff in an election year when there's a very good chance you're not going to get it enacted. For instance, his proposal last year on fixing roads went nowhere. Uh, he wasn't able to get from the legislature what he wanted in a non-campaign year. And he knows that the Republican majorities in the House and Senate are not enthusiastic about coming up with $1.2 billion in extra revenue this year and for the next nine years. So why set himself up for defeat? He's going to make an announcement. He's going to run again. And by the way, Dave, he's still got his budget that's going to be coming out in the next few weeks. Uh, three years ago, in 2011, uh, that was really a big part of what he ended up accomplishing in that year, 2011. That's where all the tax stuff came on, the tax on senior citizens' pensions, um, other stuff, cutting school funding and so forth. He didn't talk about that in the state of the state. So let's watch and see what he says in the next couple of weeks. Uh, another one of the sets of eyes and ears tuned into this was former Congressman Mark Schauer, the presumptive Democratic nominee. Um, was there, when you say then that this is kind of what you expected, not a lot of specifics for the budget, was there anything though in what was said, what perhaps wasn't said, that gives him any particular campaign um, bullet points, if you will? Was there anything that he could, he could in a sense, pounce on based well, on what I he Well, I think saw that here? what the governor said last night, or I should say last Thursday night, um, was um, his strong point thought the governor and thinks Mark Schauer, uh-uh, no. Uh, what is strong for the governor, I'm arguing, is actually a weakness because, in fact, the governor has uh, hiked, uh, well, he's hiked taxes on some segment of the electorate. He's cut funding in key areas like revenue sharing to local communities like K-12 education, like higher education, and he's given nearly a $2 billion tax break to big business, corporations. 
So the governor actually didn't talk about tax, you know, giving tax breaks to corporations, but the point is the governor is basically saying Michigan is the comeback state. Uh, and I think Mark Schauer is thinking, uh, where's the beef? You know, where's the evidence? Maybe the governor's balanced the books. Maybe he's made the trains run on time. But in terms of really turning around the state's economy, uh, I don't see it, and this is all smoke and mirrors, folks, and what the governor said last night is what he's been saying for three years, and the evidence isn't there, and that's what we're going to campaign against him on. Is there a sense, then, that the, that the, the record is lacking? Because uh, there, there was a reference uh, from one of the panelists when you were uh, talking with uh, Tim Skubik after the speech uh, to the economic turnaround, the comeback, and, and that it is perhaps a, a work in progress and, and moving forward. And you said, in effect, where is a sense that maybe the economy really isn't that much better than it was four years ago? Where is then that sense of the record of accomplishment that this governor has to run on? The real place he can point to accomplishment is balancing the budget and bringing in more revenue for state government than was the case for like the past decade where we were constantly running deficits that had to be patched up. Uh, but people could argue, you know, that might have occurred anyway, probably would have occurred anyway because of the rise in the national economy and because of the recovery of uh, the auto industry here in Michigan, which, by the way, the Obama administration wants to take major credit for rather than Rick Snyder or the Republicans. So, you know, basically, uh, the governor, you know, uh, can't really point, in my view, and I don't think in any objective observer's view, to substantial economic progress in Michigan for the people, for the 10 million people of Michigan. Uh, are we better off? We're still third in unemployment in this country, okay? We're not uh, doing well in many important benchmarks that you would want to point to. If he'd been able to dramatically say, you know, our unemployment rate has been cut in half, uh, you know, we are now uh, like number 30 out of 50 states in the unemployment rate, and that's better than 47th, uh, you know, when Governor Granholm was in office, that's one thing. But he can't say that. I, you know, I, I will say this. I think the governor is convinced in his own mind, and he could be right, that a lot of what he set in motion is going to take years to really pay off. And two years or three years to make a big turnaround happen isn't likely and hasn't happened, but he's facing an election this year, and he's trying to say what I project is going to happen down the road is actually happening right now. And Mark Schauer and the Democrats are saying, uh-uh, it isn't happening right now, and can we be sure it will ever happen? What about those unemployment numbers? Uh, because considering how many jobs we lost through the early part of, of the decade of the 2000s versus the number of private sector jobs he said have been created over these past three years, and, and when people talk about an unemployment rate is this, but when you factor in the underemployed or those who have simply given up, perhaps one could even say those who are not taking jobs that are available because it is such a, a change from prior lifestyles and so forth. How from how, how can we interpret where the economics and the job situation is? You relates? know, uh, figures can lie and liars can figure. I mean, it's how you look at the numbers and what your perspective is. I would just say it's clear that in just about every state in the entire country, the unemployment rate has come down uh, marginally over the last four years since the debacle of 2008-2009. Uh, the question is, here in Michigan, has our unemployment rate come down disproportionately better than in other states? And can the governor and the Republicans point to actual things that they've done that feed right into the unemployment rate coming down? It's hard to make that case that that's really happened. Uh, many people say, you know, if the governor done absolutely nothing in the last three years, hadn't changed the tax structure at all, hadn't gotten anything accomplished from the legislature that he called for, we would be at least as well off now compared to the rest of the country uh, as, as uh, you know, we would have been. So, I mean, that's the real issue. 
You think it sets up a possibility that um, the outside, the, the National Party, uh, those of, with, with the Obama administration, that they will see this as a seat that could be for the taking in the upcoming election, that, that some of those resources may come Shower's way? Because at this point, as you've often said, Shower is not that well known, and, and so polls are what they are at this juncture this far out. But where do you see the involvement uh, to really get behind a challenger? Yeah, there is always a question about how much national politics really plays into an election of a Michigan governor who's a state official. Um, you know, I doubt that President Obama himself or his administration or his campaign mechanism is going to make a major effort to unseat Rick Snyder. I just don't think that's probably going to happen. Uh, they would have to really smell blood in the water to make that uh, decision. They've got another race here in Michigan to worry about, which frankly I think they're probably more concerned about right now, and that's the U.S. Senate race because the U.S. Senate race uh, right now is a toss-up, and the Republicans are trying to pick up six seats nationally to take control of the Senate, and they've got a good chance to do it. So if I were the National Democrats, I would think that is really what we've got to make sure we win, not kill ourselves and spend a lot of money trying to unseat Rick Snyder. Where then do you assess that race? So that both are still running the the uh, the Peters and Land race for the open Senate seat with uh, retiring Senator Carl Levin. Uh, both polls again are not really in glamorous support of either one. It's pretty low recognition again right. because I think uh, uh, the name and, and and so forth. And but uh, how do you see that race moving well, forward? Well, I, I think in both those races, governor and U.S. Senate, the Republicans have a built-in advantage. Uh, in that name ID for the Republican nominee or likely nominee, which would be Terry Land for the U.S. Senate, Rick Snyder for governor, is pretty high. I mean, Snyder obviously is pretty high. Lands is not that great, but it's better than 50 percent. She was elected twice statewide. Uh, the Democrats have a problem in that they have got two candidates, Gary Peters for the Senate and Mark Schauer for governor who were uh, briefly in Congress. I mean, Peters is still there in his third term, but they're not well known in the state. They're barely known by better than a third of the electorate. So to begin with, they've just got to get their name ID up and they've got to be able to identify themselves to the public as electable alternatives uh, to the Republican nominee. And, you know, right now, we just don't know how that's going to play out. But I think Shower and Peters both have got to get the, the money raised to be able to do that and come up with uh, campaigns that look winnable. Too late in the game for anybody else to jump in? It seems like it would be, but, but could there be something, especially when you say how key that Senate race could be in, in determining the balance? Well, it's never too late if the filing deadline isn't until the middle of May. I mean, we're sitting here talking four months before the filing deadline, so anybody could run. You go back four years ago, it's quite interesting. Remember that at this point, Dave, um, John Cherry, who was then the lieutenant governor, uh, had made this bombshell announcement on like January 4th, he wasn't going to run. Everybody anticipated that he was going to be the Democratic nominee, just like Mark Schauer right now. So the Democrats spent like two or three months scrambling to come up with candidates uh, who would run for governor. Well, eventually they ended up with two guys, Virgil Bernero and Andy Dillon, who was the Speaker of the House, and they fought it out and Bernero won the primary and he became a nominee. But all of this happened. Uh, much later in the cycle four years ago than where we are today. I mean, it's kind of astounding, frankly, to me that you would have seemingly the set, the uh, excuse me, the competitor set this early uh, in the odd year, uh, 2013, before we even get to the election year. It's been assumed it's going to be Shower versus Snyder. It's going to be Peters versus Land for those two offices. The governor did announce another $65 million going into uh, early education, and then he talked in terms of uh, targeted tax relief from uh, the budget surplus we now know we have from the Revenue uh, Estimating Conference. 
uh, those numbers then, and this kind of goes back to the idea of how many specifics we get to or don't get to in this type of speech. Um, good points, do you think, to, to, to highlight, or, or was there a, a missed opportunity in terms of what he could say in terms of either adding something to state spending or uh, pulling back that would have garnered more enthusiasm than, than what we saw? Well, I don't think it was a missed opportunity in the sense that nobody ultimately is probably going to remember whether he made announcements about or came forth with a policy in a state of the state message versus a re-election announcement versus a budget announcement, all of which, as I said, are going to come in the next few weeks. Nobody's really going to remember six months or a year from now when he did that. The question is, when is he going to do that? Is he going to do that? How is he going to try to shape that? I think he realized that in the state of the state, he had to at least allude to the possibility there might be some tax relief because he knows particularly the Republicans in the legislature running for re-election are salivating over trying to possibly give a tax cut to the taxpayers. And for him to just ignore that subject and not even mention it, I think he might have irritated not so much the general public, but the legislators sitting in front of him whose cooperation he needs. How much uh, he, he will be at the top of the ticket, and, and as we mentioned, uh, the legislature is going to be up for re-election too. Um, when we, we look at this, and then obviously more of those particulars coming out in the budget proposal, and the idea of, of uh, political capital and what you have to, to run on and, and uh, present that strength that everybody can get behind, rally behind, um, how nervous might his own party be in terms of the, the first step on that road to November that he laid out? Well, I think they're nervous about particularly the tax on pensions. I think that's what they're really worried about. I mean, Michigan was one of the few states in the country that did not have a tax on pensions before Rick Snyder proposed it in 2011 and got the legislature to go along with him. They scaled back what he wanted to get out of that particular tax, but they still enacted something, and it's a sore point with a lot of senior citizens, and the Democrats think it's something that the governor and Republicans everywhere, particularly in the legislature who supported it, are vulnerable on. So, you know, I think the governor is walking a fine line. Dave, I honestly don't believe the governor himself wants to give any tax relief. Uh, he thinks at this point, look, we've got our house in order, we're balancing the books, we're building up a surplus for the first time in over a decade. Uh, we've got an extra 1.1, 1.3 billion dollars uh, in revenue more than you know we thought. Uh, what about the state's rainy day fund? Uh, what about our crumbling roads that he can't get the legislature to help him on? Uh, what about a whole bunch of other things that could be enacted that he thinks would be more beneficial to the state's overall economic and budgetary health? than just giving some kind of uh, pablum tax cut that's going to be pretty inconsequential when you get right down to it. Um, but I think he realizes he's dealing with majority Republicans who are much more eager to just give that money away in the form of a tax cut. Uh, if you look at tax rates right now, when you say a, a smaller or a pablum amount, what would be significant if, if we're looking at this 1 to 1.2, 1.3, however that final surplus number comes out to be, if they started looking at a, a reduction in tax rates for an average citizen, how far does something like that go before uh, you and I would start to really notice a difference? Uh, the answer is you can't go far enough. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be whatever he would propose or whatever the legislature might, it's going to mean beans, you know, chump change to the average taxpayer. Really, it's not going to be much. I think maybe what's more important is that the legislature and or Republicans, particularly running for re-election, uh, would be able to say, we gave tax relief. 
you know, somebody might say, well, what did you really give us? And, and uh, they'd have a hard time coming up with something dramatic that would make all the taxpayers say, wow, uh, you know, I really was saved a lot of money here. I don't think they can do that. But to be able to say they did something is better than being able to say or having to say we did nothing. How much of the surplus do you think you might take a uh, swing at to go for the roads proposal again? Uh, you know, I was thinking about this driving in here to talk to you this morning. You know, he avoiding potholes <laughs> and you were doing <laughs> well. So yeah, probably. seriously. Uh, I mean, you stop and think about it. What does he want? He wants 1.2 billion dollars a year. What if somebody said to him a day, Governor, would you take this deal? The legislature will just give you the whole 1.2 billion dollars in extra revenue that you can use for roads. I mean, he would take it. I would think in a heartbeat. Would the legislature give him that? I don't think so. That's the problem. Uh, Republicans, as well as Democrats, obviously, in the legislature talk about we've got to do something about our roads. It's terrible. Uh, and yet, they won't come up with anything to really fix the problem. And when they have an opportunity right now to actually take something that's been given to them that they didn't expect to have a year ago, what are they saying? Let's give it back to the taxpayers. Don't let's use it for roads. Actually, I think it would be great to have a referendum in the state. Would you like to have a tax break worth $1.2 billion that might give you, you know, a hamburger a week in tax relief? Or would you rather have your road system fixed here in Michigan? I think they'd take the latter. If they use that, though, now, I mean, I guess one would almost have to say refresh our memory, $1.2 billion per year for how long till the roads are back? Because oh. a year from now, we could be, oh. if, if you were to win re-election, maintain the majorities, the, the same discussion could be there again, and maybe the surplus isn't there on it that same It will level. be again. You're absolutely right. It would only be a one-year fix, but that's better than this past year when he got virtually nothing. They did carve out something like, you know, $300,000. Uh, to put into roads, or excuse me, $300 million to put into roads uh, that, that came out of the budget or shifting things around. But $300 million is a long way short of $1.2 billion for 10 years, each year for 10 years. And you're right. It would only be a one-year fix, but it's a heck of a lot better than what he's gotten so far. And if he actually believes that we're on the road to long-term economic recovery in this state and that we're going to have a one to $1.5 billion surplus every year for the next decade or so, he could say, hey, no problem. We can do this every year. Maybe we're going to get $2.5 billion in extra revenue. We could fix the roads, and then we can talk about tax relief or something else. We don't know, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I think there'd be reluctance in the legislature to say, let's give it all away in fixing roads just this one year, because what's going to happen the year after we do this? We're still going to have nine years left when we're supposed to be coming up with the same amount every year. Beyond then the possibility of the roads, or beyond then the, the somewhat unified call for tax relief, are lawmakers telling you anything where, in looking at that figure, and it hasn't been out there for very long, but, but are there other areas where uh, you get the sense and the pulse of where people feel um, putting money back into education, putting money back into whatever we have seen cuts from. Is there an area or a series of areas where some are feeling that that money should be spent? Well, again, you say money that should be spent. There's the deal. You've got $1.2 billion in extra revenue. So do you talk about tax cuts? Do you talk about raising, here's something the Democrats would like, the earned income tax credit back up to 20% of the federal uh, tax break uh, from the 6% it's at right now. Do you spend more, actually spend more money on K-12 education? Do you spend more on higher education, like Central Michigan University? Uh, do you give money back to local communities who say, you know, We've lost $6 billion in revenue over the last decade that was supposedly promised us by the legislature that we've been denied. Uh, there are so many ways that you can use this $1.2 billion. You can uh, spend it. 
you can uh, remove uh, credits, or you could, in, in, excuse me, you could increase credits. Uh, you could offer wholesale across the board tax relief, like cutting the state income tax from, you know, like one-tenth of one percent across the board, which, as I say, would probably give people a hamburger a week for a year. The problem is, if you start saying, let's do all of these things, you are going to have to give so little to each one of these interests, whether it's spending or tax relief, that the amount of good that you're doing, supposedly, to help these interests or the economy is going to be so small that it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, it, it almost seems to me you ought to do something in one fell swoop in one particular subject area. That's why I was thinking about fixing the roads, because that is one huge thing that everybody can get their arms around and say, yeah, we've got a terrible problem. We know we've got to do something, and here we've got this manna from heaven that we didn't expect to have. Let's do it there and leave everything else alone, because at least there, it might do something kind of dramatic. In a final minute then, and, and uh, literally almost the last word we touched on, obviously, the, the Senate race, um, there's that old adage about the six-year itch affecting a sitting president. Do you see any shakeup in the makeup of the Michigan delegation when it comes to the House of Representatives? Probably not, because the plan, the gerrymandered plan, and that's what it is that the Republicans put into effect, um, is set up in such a way the Republicans, it seems to me, can't gain any seats. The only real question is, can the Democrats win one or two marginal districts um, that they weren't able to win in 2012, which was the first year of the next decade under this uh, congressional reapportionment plan? And I would say uh, the worse it is for Barack Obama and the National Democrats, the six-year itch, as you say, the less likely it is the Democrats are going to be able to pick up those seats. And so the delegation, which is now nine Republicans and five Democrats, is probably likely to stay that way uh, in this election. That then, the Senate, the budget, we will see how it plays out moving forward. Thanks again, as always, for giving us the, uh, the broad view of all that's happening here in this building and, and across politics. Always good to have you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. And thank you as well for being with us here on Capitol Report. We've been speaking with Bill Ballinger of Inside Michigan Politics. Thanks to Chris Ogazali and Matt Osenak for their work here down at the Capitol. And thanks again to the offices of State Senator Judy Emmons for arranging us to have uh, this space in the uh, Senate meeting rooms on the fourth floor of the Capitol. Our program will be seen again tonight at 2 a.m. in the overnight rotation on CMU Public Television and posted soon to our website at WCMU.org. Next week, we'll talk with State Senator John Molinar. Thanks very much for being with us. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues.